the United States today is considerably larger than it was just a few weeks ago. As of January 2024, the country has officially claimed about 400,000 square miles under a little-known United Nations policy called the Extended Continental Shelf. So why is the United States claiming so much, and how are they even allowed to do so in the first place? Welcome to Geography by Jeff. Today is an extra special episode based on some recent news. Normally, I don't make videos based on current events, but today's was so highly geographical that I couldn't resist. After all, it's not every day that the US adds over a Texas-sized chunk of land to its borders, even if it's all underwater. But first, today's podcast is all about antipodes, otherwise known as the exact opposite part of the planet from where you are right now. It's a wonky topic, but also a very fun thought process in understanding where we are within our planet. You can listen to that episode right now with visuals right here on YouTube or on whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. All links are in the description below. Our world is mostly comprised of the vast oceans that separate our relatively small land masses. But because we're a land-based species, there's no real territorial control over the oceans, at least not in the same way as there is on land. Because of this, the United Nations has created some unique laws regarding what a country controls with respects to their nearest ocean bodies. Up until fairly recently, this has largely fallen within territorial waters, which is the 12 nautical miles off any given country's coast, and the exclusive economic zones, which continue well beyond. Territorial waters are exactly what they sound like, waters that act and behave like a traditional land border. The exclusive economic zones, however, are a bit different. A country's exclusive economic zone extends from the edge of a country's territorial water out 200 nautical miles from its coastline. And within this zone, the coastal state has special rights regarding the exploration and use of marine resources, including energy production from water and wind. However, the state does not have full sovereignty over this area. It has rights to the resources in the water column and beneath the seabed, but not the water itself. The exclusive economic zone functions as a way for countries to protect what they value from others that might wish to capitalize on it. For example, fish within Thailand's exclusive economic zone are not legally able to be fished by China's voracious fishing fleet, though that doesn't always stop them. But there's another concept at play that further expands a country's oceanic claims, the extended continental shelf. According to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the continental shelf of a coastal state comprises the seabed and subsoil of the submarine areas that extend beyond its territorial sea to the outer edge of the continental margin. The continental margin can extend up to 350 nautical miles from the coast or 100 nautical miles from wherever a depth of 2,500 meters is reached. If a country can prove that its continental shelf extends beyond the 200 nautical mile limit of its exclusive economic zone, it can claim rights to the resources on and below the seabed of the extended shelf, but not the water column above. This process of claiming an extended continental shelf involves submitting detailed scientific data to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, a body established by the United Nations. If the Commission validates the claim, the coastal state gains exclusive rights to exploit resources on the seabed and subsoil of the extended shelf such as oil, gas, and minerals. This means that a state with a claim on the continental shelf can mine and acquire the resources on or underneath the ocean floor, but does not have the exclusive rights to anything above, such as fish. In this case, China, for example, would be well within its rights to fish within another country's extended continental shelf area. Today, every country in the world that's been recognized by the United Nations and has a coastline has both territorial waters and an exclusive economic zone. But not every country has an extended continental shelf because, as it turns out, proving that you have the right to that claim is kind of difficult. But before we get to the United States' current continental shelf claims, if you're enjoying this video, hit that subscribe button. More fun geography videos are just a single click away. Typically, when we look at a map of the continents, we assume that anything above the sea level is the continent and anything that is below is not. However, geologically, that's not quite the case. In fact, every continent extends underneath the ocean by a fair amount before descending to depths that would indicate it is no longer the same land mass. This underwater portion of the continental land would be considered the continental shelf. And because every continent has a continental shelf, this opens up quite a bit of underwater land for countries to capitalize on based on the extended continental shelf policy. For example, here's Brazil's claims on their continental shelf, and here's Australia's claims on theirs. Both have extended well beyond their exclusive economic zones. The United States, as of January 2024, has finally figured out and submitted its own claims for expanding its territory based on this United Nations policy, something other countries have been doing for about 15 years now. All told, 
the United States has expanded its territory in six areas. The first, largest, and likely most valuable addition to the United States is in the Arctic Ocean, north of Alaska. This region adds about 200,000 square miles to the United States, or about one and a quarter Californias. And if it's anything like the rest of northern Alaska, there's potentially a lot of oil in this region, hence why it's so valuable to the United States. Though it must be pointed out that drilling for oil here would be devastating for the Arctic environment. Moving on, the next largest addition is in the Atlantic Ocean off almost the entire east coast of the contiguous United States. This area would add a further 100,000 square miles to the United States, a little less than a single Colorado. From there, we head back to the North Pacific where the United States is claiming a further 65,000 square miles of underwater land about the size of Wisconsin. Notably, this area is very close to Russia's exclusive economic zone, which might seem contentious, but does align with a 1990 maritime boundary agreement with Russia, though that might not be worth much today. From there, the United States additions get much smaller. It adds about 12,000 square miles off the west coast, or about the size of Maryland, 4,500 square miles and 2,500 square miles within the Gulf of Mexico, or the rough sizes of Connecticut and Delaware respectively, and a tiny 500 square miles off the Northern Mariana Islands in the Pacific Ocean, about the size of the US territory of Guam, or one third the size of Rhode Island, the smallest state in the United States. All told, the United States is planning to add about 400,000 square miles of underwater land, which is about one and a half Texases in size. That's a huge area, but it's all underwater. So why does the United States even care about all of this? And how did they figure out that these were the areas that were theirs to claim? It's not surprising that countries often want more land to claim. Outside of a very few areas on the planet, there's typically some sort of resource available that would allow the country to exploit it. But everything that we've talked about in this video is deep underwater. So deep, in fact, that doing anything with it would be very challenging, but not impossible. To explain the United States' desire for all this land, we have to first head to Norway because the Scandinavian country is doing something today that wasn't possible even a few years ago. Deep sea, underwater, mining. As it turns out, the bottom of the ocean is a relative gold mine for minerals such as lithium, scandium, and cobalt, all necessary for things such as batteries, which power basically everything today. Norway, seeing the value under the ocean, has become the first country to allow for commercial deep sea mining to extract these minerals. The United States, not one to typically let potential natural resources go to waste, absolutely wants in on this action. And as technology improves, gaining access to these materials, which is covered under the extended continental shelf policy, could be the difference between needing to buy materials on the open market at inflated prices or selling them to others who need them also at inflated prices. And all of this is being done under an established and very legal framework under the United Nations. It's just taken the United States a long, long time to get its data in order, mostly because the country wanted ironclad proof of its claim, something other countries were not as concerned with. All told, the United Nations engaged with 15 separate agencies or offices within the federal government led by the State Department, Interior Department, U.S. Geological Survey, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. These agencies began their work in 2003, a little over 20 years ago. So, suffice it to say, the United States likely has one of the strongest claims of any extended continental shelf claim in the world. And it's for this reason that the United Nations is likely to grant the United States this underwater land, effectively growing the country considerably. The United States today is, effectively, bigger than it was a month ago. And in an age of a warming climate and more sophisticated mining technologies, this could prove to be a huge boon for the country in the future. I hope you enjoyed learning more about the United States Extended Continental Shelf. If you did, please subscribe to my channel. If you want to watch more of my videos, click here. If you want to listen to the podcast, click here. Thanks for watching. See you next time.